This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Welcome to summer Pampa style. I've never lived anywhere in my life where uh, people just disappear in the summer. And uh, so anytime we come in on Sunday morning and, and you're here, any of you are here, any number of you are here, it thrills my soul uh, because so many people go and travel and uh, that's wonderful. I mean, that's, that's a blessing and a good thing for folks to be able to do that. But we're glad when you're in town uh, that you're making an effort to be here this summer. Uh, hopefully there's some folks who are not with us today that are watching or will be able to pick up the, uh, the video and check it out later and see what they've missed. I, over the years, have watched a lot of TV. I, I'm not of a mindset that I think it's all evil. Uh, some of it clear, <laughs> clearly is. But I have watched more than my share of law and order types of shows. You know the law and order types of shows. I mean, now there's law and order, law and order SVU, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, all this stuff. Well, those were all really new shows because my, my TV crime law days go back to, uh, you know, real stuff like Perry Mason. We have any Perry Mason fans in the crowd? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I mean, I was even a Barnaby Jones fan because I like the Beverly Hillbillies. Anything that Buddy Epson was in, I was going to watch. So by, I like that Matlock because I was an Andy Griffith fan, so I became a Matlock fan, all those things, you know. But here's what I know is consistent from years back, and some of you, I realize, can remember some shows before Perry Mason, but I'm just telling you, that's how far back I go. But what's consistent from back then to the newer crime shows now, when in a courtroom scene, I mean, you always have the crime at the beginning and the detectives figure it out. And honestly, most of us can figure out who did it, right? From about that, that first random person that they introduce you to, you know it's going to be them. You also know if there's an important person like a famous uh, actor or actress that just happens to randomly be in this episode, you know they did it. Because they're not on there just to be like over at the water cooler. I mean, you know, you know how to figure this out. But here's what's consistent about all of these crime and legal shows. When they're in the courtroom scene, all of a sudden the door opens and the bailiff says, All rise. You with me? Okay, let's practice that. The door opens, the bailiff says, All rise. Thank you very much. All right, we'll, we'll do it one more time. The door opens, all rise, and they all stand, except for the dishonorable ones among you that did not stand. You're going to wish you had stood when you hear the rest of this message. They stand, and then the judge is addressed as your honor, right? The reason they stand is for the honor due the judge. Here's my favorite part of those shows, when they're in the courtroom scene. It's when some, some attorney gets unruly or somebody in the back of the gallery starts going, hey, he's not the one who did it, you know, something like that. And then the judge will say, you be quiet or I will hold you in contempt. See, y'all are with me. I, I really just wanted some audience participation because it's summer and some of y'all are checked out. The judge comes in, I'll rise, your honor, be quiet or I'll hold you in contempt. Now, that is the same whether you're watching Perry Mason or you're watching the newest Law & Order episode. It's always the same. And the reason for that is the principle of honor, the principle of honor has been consistent through the years in the legal system. If you go further back, even to the creation of time, the principle of honor was established 
by Almighty God who is ultimately the supreme judge. And here's the key. If and when we practice and uh, behave in a manner that consistently honors the Lord, we will know the blessing of God in our lives. If we behave and act in a manner that shows dishonor or disrespect to, ju to, to the Lord, the eternal judge, then our lives will face the consequences and the rebuke of God for behaving dishonorably. In 1 Samuel, we looked several weeks ago at who Eli was, this priest, and he had these two bad sons. We're kind of focused on them a little bit today. Then there was this boy whose uh, parents prayed and prayed and prayed for a child. The Lord gave them a son. They brought him to the place of worship and uh, told Eli that they were dedicating their son in service to the Lord. His name was Samuel. We'll spend some time on uh, Samuel in the coming weeks. But uh, this morning, we want to focus on, on Eli. Look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. And I want to read, kind of, just hang with me, kind of a lengthy passage. Some of it will be on the screen, and I might jump around and mess them up. But my apologies to the guys in the booth if I do so. Beginning in verse 12, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Eli's sons were wicked men, and they had no regard for the Lord, or they knew not the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come down with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever uh, the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. I'm not going to explain exactly what's happening here. Just go back and read it later. Or go cook a roast and try to boil it and practice that yourself, and then you'll figure out what he's talking about. The priest was wanting more than he was entitled to. Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, let the fat be burned up first, and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. And here's the key, verse 17. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Now jump down with me to verse 22. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my son, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel, this is kind of just like interjected in there, verse 26, and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by the people Israel? Therefore, this is the, be the key verse of this whole section, verse 30. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor 
those who despise me, I will, uh, or those who despise me will be disdained or will face consequences or will be cursed or held lightly esteemed. The time is coming where I'll cut short the length or cut short the strength and the strength, uh, your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your family line, and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel in your family line, there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I did not cut off from my altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears and to grieve your heart, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. Sounds like a great movie plot, doesn't it? You read some of these Old Testament stories in these narrative accounts and you go, wow, God sounds kind of mean. Where's this nice, graceful, loving God that we hear about over in the New Testament. I heard somebody say the other day, actually I heard recording last night, somebody said that the, the Old Testament and the New Testament conflicts itself. And nothing could be further from the truth. See, the New Testament completes the Old Testament. The New Covenant completes the Old Covenant. They don't stand in uh, contradiction to one another. But what we learn from it is we learn about the, the wholeness of the character and the attributes of God. This morning I want to show uh, you three examples of how the Lord blesses those who honor Him. First, honorable behavior is rewarded by God. We learn about the honor of God in these three aspects in this passage. First, honor the Lord by honoring the place of worship. Honor the Lord by honoring the place of worship. Eli's sons here, it's clear in the story, uh, they were immoral, they had dishonored the place of God. In verse 22, it says that the sons of Eli slept with the women who served at the tent of meeting. Here are these sons of Eli that were, were given a job, given a title, given an honor to be priests at the tabernacle, and they're bringing their immorality and their immoral behavior into the place of worship. They dishonored the Lord by dishonoring the place of worship. The idea that a person can claim to know God, the idea that a person can claim to follow God, yet try to live a compartmentalized life where large sections or even minute sections of it are so dis dishonorable to God, it, it nullifies the whole, uh, the, the whole life the whole impact of a person. See, these sons of Eli were serving as priests, yet they brought their immorality into the house of God and somehow in their mind had rationalized that they could just do whatever they wanted to do because of the title that they carried. I, I remember back in, in college, there were guys that would come back in the dorm on Friday night or Saturday night and, and just brag on and on about their conquests or their activities that were clearly immoral activities and then they would get up on Sunday morning and dress up and go to church like they were just God's gift to the world like they were God's gift to God and and somehow they rationalized or they excused that they could live in immorality and yet worship God and continue to maintain and live that that same type of life nothing could be more dishonorable to the Lord than for a person that claims to know him, yet continues unrepentantly, consistently, in an extended fashion uh, to disobey the Lord. But honorable behavior honors the place of worship. The gathering of God's people should be honorable. There's another way that we dishonor the place of worship, and it kind of is just assumed here, goes, should go without saying, but you do not honor the Lord in your life if you avoid or are disconnected from a place of worship. I know it's summer, and you're here at church, and so this, I'm sure, does not apply to any of us here. But to be, as a Christian, one who claims to, to know Christ, and be disconnected from a place of worship, 
does not honor the Lord. To avoid a place of worship at all costs does not honor the Lord. Uh, go ahead to the next uh, line up here on the screen. I want you to see this. But unfaithfulness to the people of God and the place of God most often reveals a heart that does not belong to God. Continued, unrepentant, unconfessed, unfaithfulness to the people of God, whether by immorality or avoiding gathering with the people of God, and ignoring or offending the place of God through the corruption of your life, demonstrates the life of a person that in reality does not know God. And that's what we find here about Eli's sons. Back up in verse 12 in chapter 2, it says, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Which means, in some translations say, and they did not know the Lord. Which is not a surprise when you see their behavior. But the problem is, when we who say we know the Lord, we who say with our lips that we honor God, do not back that up with a consist the consistency of our life, and that's dishonorable. But God will reward honorable behavior. First, honor the Lord by honoring the place of worship. Secondly, honor the Lord by honoring the tithe. Honoring the Lord by honoring the opportunity, the responsibility to give financially to the Lord. It says the wicked sons here, they disobeyed by stealing, mishandling the offerings of the Lord. Look at verse 17 again. It says the sin of the young men was so great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. And that's what that was. That's what those sacrifices were that the people brought. And then they, as priests, were entitled to receive that offering into the temple or into the, the tabernacle, the place of worship. But they dishonored it. They treated it contemptfully. The application of this principle is twofold, both for the giver and to the, the receiver. First, there's a failure... Uh, the failure to consistently give tithes and offerings is dishonorable to the Lord. Failure to consistently give to the Lord dishonors Him. God calls, we know through Scripture, for us to be faithful, returning to Him a portion of that which He has, has blessed us with. Malachi 3.10, probably the most familiar verse, great verse, uh, reminds us about this. says, bring all of the tithes or offerings into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to hold it. What the Lord says here, he says, just prove, just, just try me out. Just test me and see. You give and just watch what the Lord does in your life, but it dishonors him to hold back and to restrict and to, and to avoid obeying him in that manner. So the Lord says to honor the Lord with the tithe. That's a principle for the giver. But here what we see in this passage, it's a principle for the receiver to honor the Lord with the tithe. The, <laughs> Eli's sons uh, fail to handle the offerings with integrity. I, I think that goes uh, also without saying. But here's where accountability falls on the church. His sons obviously were taking what was given to the Lord and hoarding it for themselves for selfish gain. Many of you may have heard uh, in the news these, these last several weeks, there's an evangelist out of South Louisiana named Jesse Duplantis. And Duplantis came out and told his supporters, I, I, I started to say the word followers, but that is a word that we shouldn't use, but came out and told his followers that the Lord told him that his supporters should buy him a, let me get the number right, a $54 million jet airplane. You follow me? This evangelist, Christian evangelist, South Louisiana, told his followers that the Lord told him they should give him money to buy this $54 million jet to go with the three that he already has. You, you following the story? Now the sad thing is, 
there will be somebody that follows him blindly that he'll end up getting that jet. And he'll walk around and say, see, God provided it. And being a good evangelist from South Louisiana, he'll kick up his knees and strut across the stage. And <laughs> Listen, any that's heresy is what it is, by the way. Any time you hear or listen to a preacher and the majority of their messages return over and over and over to the subjects of financial prosperity and material prosperity, run from them like the plague. Run away from them. Don't listen to them. Despise their, their teaching because it's false teaching. And the way you can identify it is they keep going back to that. You can tell that's the driving force of who they are. The, 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 the message is not about uh, knowing God and offering worship to God, but it's about what God can do for me. And that's heretical. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses, parts of verses 1 through 3. It says, There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Verse 2 says, And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom, uh, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words and lies. By greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words and lies. Jan and I were watching a, a TV show uh, the other night, and I think it was like an old Hazel episode or something, you know, like that. So it was kind of my taste. And there was a, and a commercial came on by this guy named Peter Popoff. You know who the evangelist Peter Popoff is? And it, it showed these ladies saying, we, we gave, and the next week I got $10,000 in the mail. We gave to, to Brother Popoff, and the next week I got $25,000 in the mail. And then this, this evangelist preacher guy comes on there, and, with, and he's, he's just all made up that you, just, you should know in, in, immediately that he's not real. And he's, he's pushing these little vials of water, holy water. Have you, ever, have you ever had fleas or ticks on your dog, and you go to the vet, and they give you these little clear squirt tubes to squirt, put right between the shoulders on their back, and it's supposed to, That's what these little vials look like, little clear thing. I, I'm thinking somebody needs to squeeze a big gallon of it on the back of this guy's between his shoulders. But he's like, send me some money, I'll send you this, and then your Lord will bless you. That's heresy, friends. But here's the, here's the sad truth. Too many Bible-believing Christians that claim truth will listen to those lies. And you know who they prey on the most? They prey on very low-income people who can't afford to give anything, but they desperately somehow think, oh, if I'll just give, then we'll come up with all this money. So they prey on very, very low-income people and very much elderly people on fixed incomes who, who just are very trusting. Those are the two folks that they prey on. And, and some, probably some of those elderly people, out of the kindness of their heart, will help a guy like Jesse Duplantis buy a $54 million jet. Christian, avoid that heresy like the plague. If you hear repeatedly a preacher going back to financial prosperity, material prosperity, any form of prosperity with a worldly origin, you've got to know that they're mishandling the offering of the Lord. They're not handling it with integrity. I'll just tell you this quickly. You might not know about how funds are handled here at our church. First off, I'll say I, I touch no money. Pray, praise the Lord. If you ever forget to, to your offering and come running in here at the last minute and try to hand me an envelope, you'll see me go like this. And I'll say, well, let's go find somebody else you can hand that to. Because I just don't... Listen, people want to blame enough stuff on a preacher. So I'm not going to let them <laughs> hand me money. Uh, but... I don't handle it. We have people that count our finances. It's double counted, triple counted, taken to the bank by multiple people where there's accountability. 
We have a finance committee that looks over our books every month and uh, assesses the financial statement, and every expenditure we have is either uh, based upon uh, annually, uh, an annually approved budget or by uh, uh, separate church action and special cases. And just to tell you this, First Baptist Church, and I can say it because my hand is not in the middle of it, but First Baptist Church, Pampa, handles its finances with integrity because we don't ever want it to be said that we are dishonorable in the way we handle the tithes and offerings of the Lord. Okay, let me move on. The third way that we find it's important uh, that, we, uh, that we honor the Lord is by uh, modeling obedience and not tolerating disobedience. I, I'm, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to explain all of it. But if you go back and see this, well, well, Eli told his sons not to do that. Well, he said it, but he never enforced it. You ever have that problem as a parent? Where you tell your kid, well, you, better, you need to do this, and if you don't do it, I'm going to such and such. Or if you don't do this, I'm going to ground you. And then you don't do it. Just as for a parent, it's dishonorable for us to not uh, enforce and expect obedience from our children. By modeling obedience... We don't permit tolerance to sin and disobedience. And that's what Eli had done with his, with his sons. Is he allowed them to continue on behaving in a manner that was, that was ungodly and, uh, and didn't honor the Lord. Here's, here's a quote that you see on the screen there before you. A parent's goal should be to raise kids to become responsible adults who love God, not to be really great kids. And sometimes the, the parent's goal is, oh, I don't want them to get upset with me. Or, I, you know, it wasn't that big a deal, and so we overlook misbehavior and just kind of just let it go. Listen, our goal as parents is not for them to like us and not for our kids to be the most popular kid in the class, but for them to grow up to know and love God. That's where our, respons our ultimate responsibility as parents uh, place an authority over our children's lives uh, should lie. Let's, let's jump on down. Just as honorable behavior is rewarded by God, dishonorable behavior is rebuked by God. Two things. God wrought immediate consequences on Eli's family, and God wrought generational consequences on Eli's family. You can go back and read about how his two sons died in one day. At the same time, imagine being the father that heard that. Not only the sadness and the sorrow, but the, the shame and the guilt that he felt because he knew this fulfilled the prophecy of the Lord that came before. He knew that he had allowed them to continue dishonoring God, and then he saw the end result of it. Not only were they punished immediately, but the generations in his family lineage would forever be limited because of their dishonor of God. Let me wrap up with this. While we were down in the Houston area last week, well, let me, let me share this verse with you first. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Just write that reference down. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to please the sinful nature will from that nature reap destruction, but he who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. <clears throat> While we're down in Houston last week, knowing that we were going down, we, we went about a half a day early uh, with, with one, primary, one primary goal. Our oldest, we were there for our youngest son's wedding, but our oldest son is buried just down the road from where Colby got married. I mean, it's a, it's a long story, but the way the Lord just painted this picture. But we went ahead of time, and my goal was we're going to go and to, to clean the, the grave marker for our son. And, and in the Houston area, with mildew and moisture and all, it they doesn't last very long because they, get, they don't look all clean and, and neat. But, but our goal was to do 
was put fresh flowers out and to, to refinish this marker and clean it up and everything. But here's what I noticed. Engraved on our son's marker were the exact words that we had engraved there in 1991. They hadn't changed. Same, same words. It said, our, our son Cole Murray Williamson, born July the 21st, 1991, died July the 30th, 1991. Am I, I'm, is that right? I'm getting in trouble. And then there's a verse at the bottom. It says, let the little children come unto me. And the words on that marker were exactly the way that we had them engraved years ago. And it'll be like that forever. Until the Lord calls us home and then what he does with this earth, I'm not too worried about. I saw that picture of the word honor chiseled in stone. God's principle of honor endures through the ages. It was not only appropriate to honor God in the days of Eli and Samuel. It's appropriate to honor God today. Because honor never changes. The way we're called to honor our fathers and our mothers, the way we're called to honor the church, the way we're called to honor God's design for the family, ultimately the way we're called and commanded by God to honor Him is something that doesn't fluctuate, it doesn't change with the mood or the culture. It will remain constant for all eternity. And when we get to heaven, we will experience eternal honor of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, of God the righteous judge. And I think that we'll stand in his honor, and I think that we'll fall on our face before his honor. Are you living your life in a way that honors the living God? Would you stand with me?